Well into his middle age and with a mighty empire under his control, Genghis Khan's thoughts linger on what will happen to that empire after he dies. What will become of his family? What will become of the world he has worked so hard to shape? The 13th century. The Muslim lands of the Khwarezm Empire were the richest and most sophisticated in the world. Its citizens soared above their contemporaries in Europe, India, and China in astronomy, mathematics, agronomy, and many other fields. But because they stood higher, they had the furthest to fall. A hundred thousand Mongol horsemen stormed the Khwarezm cities. The Sultan of Khwarezm had four times as many soldiers, but the Mongol forces were terrifying. And they honored their promise of clemency to all who surrendered as strictly as they honored their promise of destruction to all who resisted. Cities fell one after another. Many surrendered without a fight. Others held out for a few days or weeks before falling. After defeating each city, Genghis Khan sent clerks to divide the civilian population by profession, including doctors, astronomers, judges, engineers, teachers, artisans, and religious leaders. They especially sought out people who spoke multiple languages. Despite all of their growth, wealth, and power, the Mongols still practiced no crafts themselves other than war, herding, and hunting. All of the skilled work done in their growing empire was done by the people they conquered. They needed teachers as much as they needed riches. But one group in particular could expect no mercy from the Mongol forces, that group being the wealthy and the powerful. Under the chivalrous rules of warfare as practiced in Europe and the Middle East during the Crusades, aristocrats were protected and kept as hostages to be ransomed. The Mongols had no use for such pleasantries. To prevent future wars, they sought out and eliminated any enemy aristocrats they could find. Aristocrats offered nothing of value to the Mongols, and were the most likely to resist them successfully in the future. By eliminating the aristocracy, they decapitated the social system of their enemies. As the 1220s rolled in, Genghis Khan was in his 60s, at the height of his power, with nothing and no one standing in his way. But despite his overwhelming success as a conqueror, he was really struggling as a father. Custom held that each son in a herding family inherited some of their family's herd. Genghis Khan intended to instead offer each son a piece of his empire. However, he also needed to choose one son to be the next great Khan after he died. He summoned a family Kurultai to discuss the matter. His two eldest sons, Jochi and Chagatai, were tense and terse with one another. Ogade, his third son, arrived to the meeting slightly late and also slightly inebriated. Genghis Khan asked his eldest son, Jochi, to speak first on the matter of succession. In doing so, he emphasized Jochi's rank as his eldest son, implying he was the likely successor. Chagatai did not agree, and interrupted before Jochi could answer. Jochi lunged at his brother, and the two men started to fist fight. Genghis Khan broke up the fight and tearfully pleaded with his sons, begging them to understand how different things were before they were born when nobody was safe. He ordered them to respect each other, but he knew that he could not impose a choice on them that would last after his death. They would have to find a compromise. After much discussion, the family decided that neither Chagatai nor Jochi should become their father's heir, but instead agreed that the role of successor should go to their mellow, good-natured, and hard-drinking brother, Ogade. Genghis Khan then allotted his personal lands and herds to each son and separated Jochi and Chagatai, giving them kingdoms at far opposite ends of his territory. This ordeal cast a pall over the remainder of the campaign. Genghis Khan was now keenly aware of how much work he needed to do to preserve the empire after his death. He had been so dogged in his pursuit of empire and unification that he'd neglected his family. He put much effort into trying to mend the relationship between his eldest sons. He assigned them jointly to a campaign, but neither brother could agree on what tactics to use. And because of their bickering, the campaign stretched on for six months, an unprecedented amount of time for a Mongol siege. Eventually, they had no choice but to burn the city to the ground and flood it, destroying it utterly and leaving nothing to loot. In 1222, the Mongol conquest reached the city of Multan in modern-day Pakistan. Genghis Khan had set his sights on northern India, the seat of silk production. Here, however, he faced a new enemy that stopped him in his tracks. 
As soon as the Mongols left the dry and cold mountainous regions, both warriors and horses grew sick and weak. The Mongol bows, which were so well adapted to the extreme cold and heat of the steppe, weakened in the damp air and lost their accuracy. The Mongols were forced to fall back, and sustained massive casualties as they withdrew to the more familiar climate of Afghanistan. Despite this setback, they had succeeded in their goal of conquering the Khwarezm Empire, bringing Central Asia and much of the Middle East under Mongol control. To celebrate, Genghis Khan called for a fate that ended up being the largest hunt in history. His men cordoned off a massive area of territory, and tens of thousands of soldiers from different armies converged on the field from different directions. The hunt lasted for months, and was intended as more than a celebration. Genghis Khan also wanted to use it to mellow relations between his sons, and to end the campaign on a cooperative note. Upon returning home, the victorious Mongol army saw the fruits of their conquest. The nation had been utterly transformed. Girls who had spent their days milking goats and yaks were now wearing silk, while their new servants performed menial labor for them. Elders who had never seen metal in their lives now cut meat with Damascus steel, girded with ivory hilts. They served yak's milk from silver bowls while their musicians sang to them. But Genghis Khan was not built for this life. He didn't want to stop conquering, or maybe he couldn't stop conquering. He set out once again to campaign against the Tangut, the very first foreign nation he had conquered after his election as Great Khan. The Tangut had refused to offer troops for the Khwarezm invasion, a slight that could not stand, and establishing a base in the Tangut kingdom would offer a second chance at the Sung dynasty, a target he still coveted. And that is where Genghis Khan's story very suddenly and very mysteriously ends. What happened next remains something of a mystery. Some say that while traversing the Gobi to fight the Tangut, Genghis Khan stopped to catch some wild horses and was thrown from his mount, sustaining internal injuries. Some legends say that he was assassinated by a sex worker, struck by lightning, poisoned, or killed by a magic spell cast by the Tangut king. Heck, Marco Polo even reports in his book chronicling his time in the court of Kublai Khan, uh, Genghis Khan's grandson, that the great Khan was killed after taking an arrow to the knee. All that we know for sure is that just before the Mongol victory over the Tangut, Genghis Khan died quietly. A procession would have set out towards Mongolia with Genghis Khan's body on a simple cart. His horsehair spirit banner would have led the way, and behind the procession would have followed his horse with a loose bridle and an empty saddle. He was buried anonymously in the soil of his homeland, without a monument to mark his grave. Genghis Khan transformed Mongol warfare from a messy tribal raiding system into an intercontinental affair fought on multiple fronts across thousands of miles. His battlefield techniques made the heavily armored knights of medieval Europe obsolete, replacing them with disciplined cavalry moving in organized units. He made brilliant use of speed and surprise on the battlefield, and perfected siege warfare to such a degree that he ended the era of walled cities. He taught his people to fight not only across incredible distances, but to sustain their campaigns over years, decades, and eventually over three generations of constant fighting. His last ruling descendant remained in power in Uzbekistan until he was deposed by the rising tide of the Soviet Revolution in 1920. Genghis Khan was also brutal. His goals were achieved through the deaths of millions. The Mongols made no technological breakthroughs, founded no new religions, wrote no great books or dramas, and offered the world no new crafts or methods of agriculture. They simply conquered and assimilated, and their tactics left parts of the world depopulated to this day. But the Mongols absolutely did change the world, and that was what young Temujin had desperately wanted from the very moment he first learned how harsh, violent, and unforgiving life could be. He eradicated torture, kidnapping, and raiding from his world, but at the cost of countless lives and entire cultures. Is peace bought with blood and maintained with force truly peace? It may be impossible to say whether Genghis Khan left the world better than he found it, but it was still undeniably changed. <laughs>